Any sort of history, whether it's European history or Aboriginal history, can alter through time. So the best accounts are always first-hand accounts. Um, so with Aboriginal history, uh, one of my problems, one of my dilemmas has been that many of the, many of the areas I did research in, the Aboriginal people are gone. You're talking about the mountainous country, there are whole tribes, nations, whatever you want to call them, they're, they're extinct or very few living descendants and most of them are a long way from uh, their tribal land. So I can think of the, the, the Yathmathang Aborigines around Omeo. Uh, they were reported extinct by the 1880s. And there might be a few people with, uh, with their blood, um, but most of the stories are gone. So when it comes to Aboriginal history, I've tried to go back and find European accounts. And there are some fabulous European accounts and, and you've always got to have reservations that they're, they're being written from the European perspective. But there's a lot of detail in those accounts and often you can find the names of the fish, the names of the rivers, detailed descriptions of Aboriginal uh, practices. <laughs> Some of the information that's turned up is just astounding that uh, Aboriginal people weren't just hunter-gatherers. They managed the rivers, they managed waterways, they built dams, weirs, fishways. Uh, they collected fish, shifted fish, operated sanctuaries. Uh, it's not a, a simple hunter-gatherer culture. It was sophisticated management of the land. Well, I have uh, touched base with one or two Aboriginal people. One, one I can think of is uh, Don Briggs, who's a Yorta Yorta elder from the Central Murray, and he had the stories of this people. And that's the thing, I, I've been reconstructing the history of fish. In some cases, I suppose, I've reconstructed some of the history of some Aboriginal groups too, of their ways of life. And, and that's something that's happened in this project that I couldn't have predicted. So I got curious, I wanted to find if there were Aboriginal names for trout cod. Did they recognise trout cod, Murray cod as different? And the answer was yes, I came across the names. And there was one bit of detective work, there's been an argument going on on, on the Mitamita River that there's a locality known as Hinamunji. And modern historical references say it's an Aboriginal word that means a lack of fish. And some local historians like Max Dyer have said, no, that's not true. It means codfish or place of cod. And there's been a debate going on. And, and through some historical research and some newspaper articles, uh, we've actually been able to identify the origin of the words and the meaning. And it turns out that um, Hino comes from Yathmathang language and was pronounced Inna or Inmi, and it is cod. And Munji was fish. And it was not the name of the fish, it was Aborigines trying to commu communicate with Europeans saying cod, fish, just as I would say kookaburra, bird. So Inna was a local name of, of cod and uh, uh, early historical accounts record a number of names around Omeo like Jugal Munji, Hino Munji, Bingo Munji and their, their names of fish. From that, Peter Jackson from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority said, uh, can you compile a list at the start of the, the publication of you know, the scientific name of each fish, uh, the common names used by Europeans and the Aboriginal names? And I thought, OK, I'll do that. I'll start tracking down more information. And then I came across a newspaper article written by Mary Gilmore. Uh, her picture's on the $10 note. And she grew up at Wagga. And I found a newspaper article written by Mary where she talks about there was a whole series of stone traps on the rivers in various locations. And she names some of the locations. There's one downstream of Narandra between Narandra and Hay. Um, there was one on the Lachlan River. There was one on the Upper Murray. There was one on the Upper Murrumbidgee. But Brewarana was the sole survivor. And that these places were not just traps for trapping fish. Some of these traps covered many hectares of water and they were actively managed by putting stones in to let small fish in and out, in and out but keep big fish in, in those places. And that 
One of the purposes of stone traps was for regular gatherings of all the clans and tribes. It would involve thousands of Aborigines and it was a source of food for them. But the purpose of those meetings was discussions on land management, that what areas would be sanctuaries for the next few years? Which areas would we close to fishing? Which areas would we protect the swans? And the other stuff that Mary wrote about was all the small streams in, in the Riverina and along the Murrumbidgee having lots and lots of wooden balks on them creating permanent ponds, sanctuaries of water, sanctuaries for fish. So this picture emerged of Aboriginal people not being hunter-gatherers but active managers of fisheries and lands holding management meetings involving thousands of people where sanctuaries would be set aside, how this would be managed and you know it's profoundly changed my view of Aboriginal people from being you know hunter-gatherers, primitive people I suppose that's a stereotype to a very sophisticated civilization that knew how to manage this continent.